know, the primary benefit of martial arts all comes from training. Hey there, this is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 306, and today I'm joined by Master Danny Dring. If you're new to the show, you may not know my voice. My name is Jeremy Lesnick. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. I have an amazing job because I get to talk to martial artists about martial arts and then share it with all of you. I'm also blessed because we have a wonderful team producing amazing martial arts apparel and accessories all under the general umbrella of martial arts because you know what martial artists we have much more in common than we do that separates us and i think it's important that we remember that if you want to check out some of those products you can find them at whistlekick.com or some of them are even over on amazon you can find the show notes to this and other episodes the other 305 episodes that we've done man it's crazy to say that whistlekickmartialartsradio.com because I am the least creative person in the world when it comes to naming things, but that's okay because it makes it easier for you. Let's talk about today's guest. Master Danny Drain comes to us from the South, from Arkansas, where he has achieved multiple lifetimes worth of martial arts accomplishments from black belts in a number of styles and high ranks as well. And despite all of that, the thing that has always struck me about Master Dring is his humility, his willingness to just support others in what is important to them. As you'll hear in today's conversation, almost everything he talks about regarding himself relates to others. He almost defines himself by his relationships to other people. And to me, that's just a testament to his humility, to his dedication to others. Living life of service, whether that's law enforcement, whether that's martial arts, whatever it is. And that's why I was so honored to have him on the show today. I think you'll enjoy this, and if nothing more, I'm sure you're going to come away inspired. I was actually kicking while we were talking. True story. (laughs) Master Dring, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. As as I said to you and I'll say publicly, it's long overdue. Anyone who can inflict that much pain on me (laughs) deserves (laughs) to have some airtime for sure. And and listeners, I'll I'll, I'll explain more later what it, it seems more appropriate contextually but for now you know just know that that this man is is the real deal and uh can can hurt you in ways you never even knew were physically possible (laughs) thank you (laughs) only the martial arts is that a compliment right so that's that's just absolutely awesome it it is a it is a weird world that we occupy where you know some of our best friends are the folks that who have hurt us the most yeah, yeah, you know, simulated murder, and you know, it's just good martial art training, and it endears, uh, it endears people to us. It does, it does, because really, I mean, if somebody hits you in the face, you kind of have two responses. You can enjoy it, you can compliment them and recognize, hey, maybe I should have done something differently so you didn't hit me in the face, or you can get mad. And if you get mad, you don't last long in martial arts, because... Either nobody wants to work with you or people who are much better than you want to work with you and teach you a lesson. Yeah. And, and the outcome of, yeah. of, of either of those angry options, it just, it's not sustainable. No, no, it really, uh, it really isn't. And it's amazing how we, we foster that and, and uh, tend to take, uh, blood and trauma kind of becomes our life. <laughs> you know, we we uh, twist on people and we uh, we we strike on people, and and yet there's a certain attitude that uh, is expected to go along with that. You know that uh, you know it's uh, don't get mad, get even, and uh, learn from it. And because once you uh, 
you know, once you uh, get mad, you kind of lose that cool, then uh, you're right. People don't want to work with you anymore or they want to adjust that attitude and help you see the error of your ways in, uh, in no uncertain terms. And it's, uh, it, it's an interesting, uh, team that runs all the way, uh, all the way through, uh, you know, martial arts and it pretty much doesn't matter what school or style or whatever. That's just a universal. Yeah. I've heard some great stories from, from some of the, the older folks about, adjusting attitudes within their school, you know, someone would transfer in from a different school or maybe they weren't as, as kind as, uh, as friendly in the, in the mutual benefit of blunt force trauma to each other, as you, as you called it. And, you know, okay, it's sparring night and, uh, you know, King of the Hill sort of thing, and, you know, whatever it was. And those folks either had, they had that adjustment or they didn't come back. True true uh, and it doesn't take long i don't think there's anybody that's run a martial arts studio that doesn't have some uh somewhat fond recollections <laughs> you know of of that guy you know there's somebody that came in that uh and you know we all get either a little too ambitious or uh, it, people get uh a little carried away they need to be toned down there's uh you know, the ethos of the school and the way they conduct their uh, sparring sessions and that, uh, that attitude adjustment is a theme that, that transcends. Do you, obviously that, the attitude of any individual at part of any group is really part of the, the kind of overall culture. People come in and they either adapt to it or they don't last long. You know, I've, I've been part of a lot of groups and you can always spot that person who comes in and, and they're not going to last. You know, you can usually pick them out. As someone who owns a school, how thoughtful are you of creating that culture? Or is it something that just seems to happen? You know, there's a, I believe it's, it's two-pronged. Most schools reflect the attitude and the culture of the instructor. There's a, and <clears throat> It, it it just sort of happens, but it also just sort of happens because of the way the leadership and the gym chooses to uh, chooses to nurture and and develop their students. You know, I mean, disciplined gyms. There's there's you know, I mean, I've I've boxed, I've kickboxed, I do MMA, you know, but I'm still also very well grounded in the uh, traditional in the traditional arts. And so there's a certain discipline that, uh, that I want. And, I, and yet having cross trained and worked out with tons and tons of different, uh, of different people have been in, in different environments. And it's always interesting to me to, that have the environment that you're training in, be it a boxing gym or a kickboxing gym or an MMA gym or a BJJ gym or a, you know, a traditional martial art type uh, setting, Taekwondo or karate or, or you know, whatever, name name your flavor. Uh, ultimately, it's going to reflect the, uh, the the value of the leadership. You know, is there is there a disciplined approach? Is it a trash talking approach? Is it, you know, been in gyms where many came in and it was game on. It was a war. And uh, there was... Uh, it, it wasn't about building people up. It was more about beating people down. And then there's other gyms where there's certainly that uh, it was more about building people up. And and um, uh, there was the occasional beat down, but it was it was just a different different attitude. And uh, so, how an instructor uh, you know chooses to run. For, run the gym and how the leadership chooses to run the gym is, is reflected throughout its students. You know, it's the old saying, there's no such thing as bad students, only bad instructors. And well, that may not be a hundred percent true. It's kind of been the, uh, uh, been a, a, a guide for me personally inside my, uh, inside my gym. Uh, 
how have, have you... come across a few bad students. But yeah. By and large, I think that, that you you got to be really careful because you can use that to hide behind. So if you uh, if you kind of keep that as like, look, there's no such thing as bad students, only bad instructors, then that makes you work to be the best instructor you can be. How have you changed as an instructor over the years? Oh, awesome question. You know, the biggest change was in the beginning, the only person that I was truly passionate about teaching was myself. <laughs> you know, I got into the, as a young man, uh, you know, I, I uh, um, got into martial arts and then, uh, um, uh, just prior to going to college. Well, I trained a little bit when I was about seven years old um, with my father. And at that time, the only school was across town. So his hours changed at his job and, and uh, we, we weren't able to continue, but I got a taste. I got to train for, I don't know, maybe six, eight months. I don't even think we trained a full year, but it sparked uh, an interest and, and it was something that would come back to me. And then growing up, I mean, you know, you used to know what season it was by the sport you played. You know, I mean, it was football in the fall and basketball in the winter and track in the spring and baseball in the summer. And then you knew, you knew pretty much what season it was by the sport you were playing. And, and uh, uh, but eventually I found my way back into the martial arts and then uh, uh finished up my college career. I was teaching, you know, teaching my way through school. And then I, I bought the school that I was, uh, bought the school that I was teaching at and I've been in business ever since. And in the beginning, it was to be able to train as much as I felt like I need. I always felt like, well, I've got potential. I just have to work really, really hard to develop it. And, uh, I wouldn't say I was, uh, you know, I mean, didn't come from the deep end of the gene pool in terms of uh, uh, fast twitch muscle fiber. Or, you know, I mean, I wasn't I'm not I wasn't that big and I wasn't necessarily that strong and wasn't necessarily that fast. What I had was the potential and I had a pretty good work ethic. You know, I mean, my deal was my success in competition and in training in various arts was I'll train while you sleep. You know, I mean, I'll get up earlier and I'll be at the gym first. I'll get up early in the morning and train. I'll, I'll be there at noon. I'll be there in the evening. And then I'll, you know, when everybody else has left, I'll be over there getting some extra squat kicks in, or I'm going to be, you know, knocking out some extra work, extra rounds on the bag or, you know, doing whatever. So, and, and my motivation when I first started teaching was that was, how uh, that was the only way I figured I could get enough mat time in was to be uh, teaching. And, and I'm a big believer that when you're teaching others, you're probably teaching yourself more than you'll ever teach anybody else because you're going over the fundamentals. You're picking up the details. You're working on, you know, I, I tell everybody, and, and I still maintain this as a, uh, as a testament, and I, I want my instructors to do this. And that's every class that I teach, whether I'm teaching a seminar in Manchester, New Hampshire, or whether I'm, I'm teaching a private lesson in Little Rock, Arkansas, wherever I'm at, every time I teach, at least one person should get better. And that's me. Because if I'm not teaching, if I don't believe in what I'm teaching strongly enough that I want to get better at it, then how am I going to get anybody else better? You know, if, if you're not passionate about what you're, the material you're presenting, and if you don't believe that to be important, and if that's not motivation enough to want to get better at it, then how are you going to motivate anybody else? You know, so I, I tell my instructors that, and it's kind of a, kind of a selfish thing, you know, but it, it's also very true. If you're not motivated to get better at the material you're presenting, then you're not going to get anybody else better either. You know, you know it's just not going to be that strong. And then, uh, as far as the biggest change is that after, you know, a lot more years of the instruction than I almost want to admit out loud over the air, I, uh, 
you get to see how to how to guide and and how important it is to be able to guide people's careers and being able you know to have the the benefit of vision of being able to take somebody from point A to point B, point B to point C, the uh, the overview and uh, and after a while it. You know, I mean, it's not that I still don't want to continue to improve because it's a, it's fundamentally, you know, when you're through improving, you're through. So uh, I still want to continue to to grow in my personal martial arts journey. But now I think that's taken a little bit of a backseat to guiding, guiding others in their martial art journey. You know, you kind of realize there, there comes a, you can beat a lot of things, but you can't beat Father Time. So you use it to your advantage. You you uh, and you're uh, you know I'm working to be the instructor's instructor, the black belt's black belt, the uh, you know not just inside my gym, but with other people that I work with and 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 uh, help out and and the various organizations I belong to and the different, uh, uh, the different people that I work with. So I hope that kind of yeah. covered those bases for it you. It does. It does. So here we are. We, we, we can clearly see your passion for teaching, but you, you very quickly talked about how you got into it, that you were training somewhere and you bought the gym. So I want to go back. I want to unpack that because we didn't really talk about how you got started in martial arts. I mean, we talked about your your first foray, but at some point something happened. You started training again and you gained that passion that led you to buy a gym. So can we we go back to that point in time and talk about how that happened? Sure, that uh I started uh, in Taekwondo. Uh there's that that uh my first gym, uh, the very first school that I trained at was a uh, Taekwondo school. And, uh, I had a little bit of an interest, you know, I've always had an interest in boxing. Mm-hmm. Boxing gyms weren't as prevalent. I mean, you know, there's a, it's a lot, it was a lot easier to find a, uh, uh, a martial, I mean, a Taekwondo school than it was a, uh, even back then. There, there wasn't like a neighborhood boxing gym on every corner. And, uh, of course, I'm back, I'm going to date myself back in the late seventies. It wasn't necessarily like there was a uh, martial arts school in every gym, but there were a few. And, uh, there was a school that, uh, wasn't too far that, uh, far from me that I, I went and started training at because proxemics, I mean, that's what it was. I didn't, and I never, you know, I didn't join the martial arts to be a stylist. I joined the martial arts to get in better shape and learn how to defend myself. And it's funny that journey. You know, you get in and get involved, and it led me into competition and uh, point tournaments, and then kickboxing, and uh, you know, it's a, it's been a, a a crazy ride. And then. All these years later, I'm kind of back to where I started from. I want to be in better shape, and I want to be able to defend myself. So, you know, it's kind of funny how it kind of goes a uh, full circle. But, uh, yeah, you know, I didn't know, you know, when you first joined up, looking back, I I didn't know Taekwondo from, you know, Shotokan, from Shoranru, from Gojo-ru, from Genpo, from... You know, I mean, you have no idea. I at least I didn't at the beginning. I mean, I had no idea there's so many different kinds of you know, clovers, so to speak. You know, I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of martial arts out there, and uh, so it wasn't about to me. It wasn't about style. It was about self defense. It was about being in better shape and learning how to defend myself, and and uh, you know, just training. And then. Uh, uh, after uh, I got into it, and then uh, I lived in Waco, Texas. Went to school at Baylor University down in Waco for a couple of years. And while I was there, I trained in Shotokan and uh, did uh, a little bit of Taekwondo when I came back to Arkansas, like you know, between some between semesters or or in the summer break. 
and then we trained trained show to climb when I was in Texas. And when I came back, I finished my uh, college career at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, and uh, got my degree in psychology. And then uh, worked my way through school teaching uh, teaching taekwondo. Had uh, earned my uh, had earned my black belt. Uh, had had started uh, teaching at the gym, and uh, was working my way through school. You know, it's funny because when I first came back, I was at the gym so much. It was like a Nautilus, you know, a fitness center. I had to, uh, a Nautilus on, on one side, you know, back on the school on the other. And, and uh, I started, you know, I was just at the gym so much. I started out as a Nautilus and a you know, fitness instructor, weightlifting and and uh, working on that side of it. and just because I was at the gym so much training all the time. It was like, you know, I ended up getting a job there. They're like, well, we need to put this kid to work. And then, uh, as I got high enough in her uncle, started teaching some classes and just, I was there all the time and then became an assistant instructor and then became the full-time instructor. And then, uh, was worked, uh, I laid one semester off. Uh, I was going to school year round pretty much. I was working full-time. Uh, at the gym, I was going to uh, school, carrying a full student load, and then I was competing. You know, I was traveling around, I was fighting in the uh, tournament circuit uh, in the state and, and regionally. Uh, laid off on summer school session, just I took a kickboxing match and um, fought, uh, fought on the old PKA series. Um, it was my debut. Uh, my debut kickboxing match, which I don't really recommend fighting on national TV for your first uh, time to step in the ring, looking back at it, you know, young and dumb. Uh, but, uh, it was, it was, uh, an event that got me, uh, motivated to uh, learn more about kickboxing and about fighting in general. So, uh, uh, more than just, you know, the point point stuff. Um, so that was, yeah, that's how I pretty much got, uh, how I pretty much got going. And at, uh, that foray into kickboxing, um, it was interesting. I first met Joe Lewis. I mean, I, I've got, a, I'm now currently an eighth degree in uh, Taekwondo and, uh, I had a pretty good run. I mean, I, I was a five-time open circuit state champion here in Arkansas in uh forums are fighting. Uh, I was a, a four-time national champion in the United States Taekwondo Federation space. There's, there was two USTFs back then, uh, one based out of Colorado, that was ITF, uh, Chuck Seraph's group. And then there was another one based here in Arkansas that uh, was started by a guy named Jimbo Team that uh, uh, Scott McNeely, my name was Scott McNeely, ended up uh, taking over. I was running for Mr. Boteen and then ended up buying it. And, uh, the, uh, we had a tournament circuit, you know, I mean, these were, when you said you were a champion, it wasn't just going and fighting and winning in one tournament. It was, you know, you competed in tournaments all year long. Uh, and you get, you got points for a second and third, whoever had the most points at the end of the year was the, was the uh, crown champion for that year. And then the men's third and fourth degree black belt, I was, a uh, fourth degree black belt for five years. I was national champion four years and missed it, uh, missed it by two points one year. And it still galls me, <laughs> but I had a pretty good run in the USDF. Uh, same thing with the open circuit. You know, you compete at tournaments all year long and then, you know, crown champion at the end. Uh, I, uh, uh kickboxed in there. I, I competed uh, internationally. I was on an ITF USA uh, team. I fought in Athens, Greece in 1987, um, which is pretty good. I was team captain of a global Taekwondo Federation USA team. I fought in uh, Moscow, Russia in uh, 93, which was, uh, which is pretty neat. So internationally, I've got six gold medals and uh, two silver medals. And uh, we've hosted some teams from Russia over here in the United States as well. So that, uh, that was interesting. And, um, uh, had a pretty good run. Did a lot of, did a lot of that. My, uh, my two big uh, mentors as far as 
you know, uh, kickboxing was, uh, Joe Lewis. I first met Bill, uh, first met Joe, I guess, shoot, I was a blue belt. I mean, I was still a kid and in, uh, college first time I met, uh, Joe and then he would come to town and do seminars and I'd go to his seminars. And then, um, I remember the first time he was coming through town. He knew me from some of the seminars, called me up, wanted to do a seminar at my school and had him in. And then, uh, Really, uh, you know, fall, uh, was fortunate to get to uh, be influenced by him. He was a huge influence in my career, and then also Bill Wallace. So uh, I've got a currently an eighth degree black belt with Bill in the Superfoot Systems, and then uh, a seventh degree black belt uh, with Joe and the Joe Lewis Fighting System. Joe actually uh, came out of hospice. Uh, I touched it for my son. Came out of hospice right before he passed on uh, brain cancer, and I got my uh, seventh degree uh, with him. Uh, I also hold the rank of seventh degree in a Japanese style of jiu-jitsu, known as weeping style. It's kind of a family system. A gentleman by the name of Burl Parsons. I trained with Burl and uh, got ranked from him. And then I also have a fourth degree black belt in uh, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I have a bronze medal. I went to the International Masters and Seniors. You know, when I first started training in BJJ, uh, I did my first seminar, and it was either at the end of 90 or beginning of 91. It was right around New Year's. I just couldn't really remember which side of New Year's it was. Beginning of 91, uh, I did a seminar with uh, Horton and Chris Gracie, and uh, it was almost three years. First UFC was in 93. So, you know, it was before the first UFC by far. And it's difficult to find grappling, but that was part, you know, it was Bill and, uh, it was Joe and, uh, Bill, cause they both wrestled. Uh, you know, Bill was the wrestling coach at Memphis state university and, uh, was a judo player. That's how he blew out his knee. But, uh, both those guys and, and Joe was the first person to go, Dane, what are you going to do if a big wrestler shoots at your feet? I was like, well, I really don't know. <laughs> you know that they uh, and both have uh, very well-rounded. You know, those guys are just incredibly uh, well-rounded martial artists and on so many levels. But uh, got involved with uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu from there, and was just like, yeah, it was just a little bit ahead of the curve before uh, they really went as, as mainstream and uh, got my black belt in Rio de Janeiro in 2001. Uh, like, um, uh, my coach was a guy by the name of Tony Manuel, and uh, he was a Nobunyo black belt. I mean, I received my, my – was actually presented – Tony at that time wasn't high enough in rank to present the black belt, so it was presented to me by Andre Pedneris of Nobunyo fame. Um, Pretty cool. And then I also have a black belt uh, by a guy named John Karab in Shornru, but it's actually a, an honorary kind of black belt, but it, I'm proud of it. John was one of the guys that uh, Joe credited with teaching him how to fight. Uh, so uh, Mr. Karab's pretty uh, 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 pretty humble about it and doesn't talk too much about it, but I know what Joe told me about John and, and always bragged up on him. And I've had the uh, opportunity to train with uh, Mr. Crab at, at various camps and clinics. And, you know, uh, he's jumped in there and done some of the seminars that I've taught. And, and uh, I think it's really a, a neat thing. And it, it was an honorary just for keeping uh, Joe's stuff alive. So um, it's more of a black belt for Mr. Crab than it is uh then it is a, a black belt in Shorner, the way I look at it. But he's a fighter and he's uh, a black belt by him. But so that's a little bit about my uh about some of my ranks and, and uh a little bit of my kind of martial art uh history. I've been blessed to train with some really you know, I mean uh, Joe Lewis and Bill Wallace, those guys were my heroes growing up. I mean, you know, when I started in the martial arts, they were on the cover of all the magazines and they were in the movies. And I remember watching, you know, Bill in a force of one with uh, Chuck Norris and watching, uh, you know, Joe and some of his movies and, and, and uh, watching those guys fight on TV and then 
to have them bring me in to teach their black belts has, you know, been a, a truly uh, an honor of mine. You know, I think that that's, uh, you know, really a uh, really a cool thing, and and uh, it's been uh, it's been great, and it's really me. The styles that I've I've trained in, uh, you know, it's kind of like Bruce Lee said, out fighting, in fighting, trapping, grappling, and on the mat. And this mix of styles that I've ultimately worked out in and the, and the martial arts and the martial artists that I've been exposed to have given me the ability to kind of flow through the range of, uh, uh, of distance. And, and, you know, I've got out fighting styles and in fighting styles and grappling styles. You know, you, you tend to really, really get into it. You tend to learn a lot about a lot of different things, you know, and from being uh, fortunate enough to be asked in to teach at various camps and clinics and, and uh, seminars and then jumping out there and training with just some really fantastic martial artists. You, you cross train a ton and you end up picking up a lot uh, from a lot of different people and it tends to flesh out your education and uh, good information just transcends style. Nice. Now here we are, we're talking about a list of achievements that would take most people multiple lifetimes. And I think if we go back, we can, we can hear from what you described during college, working full school load training, you know, whether you were in Arkansas or in Texas, obviously there's a pretty solid work ethic in there. So where did that come from? Uh, you know, I have to kind of pretty much credit my uh, parents with that, that, uh, that idea of, you know, if you want something, you work hard for it. You know, I just kind of, that was the ethos growing up and, uh, being motivated to, to go, go get it. And you now I'm a, a voracious reader. <laughs> you know, I, I uh, uh, always uh and, and staying staying motivated and i just believe that if you want something bad enough you you go out there and and have to get it and so that i guess a passion you know you, you got to have a little bit of a a passion for something and but but passion without a work ethic is just kind of a pipe dream you know you've got to uh you got to put it in action and so I always felt like uh, if you want it bad enough, you get out there and you work for it. So and that's, uh, and, and you've got to have fun. I mean, you know, people tend to, I enjoyed it, you know, that's, that's really important too. I enjoyed uh, challenging myself. I enjoyed pushing myself. And it was funny. I've told people that, now is my time to kind of trade on that because when I was younger, when everybody else was uh, working their working their business, and certainly I worked my business, or I still wouldn't be in business. You know, all these uh, all these years later, I've been teaching continuously in the same gym and here in Central Arkansas for a long time now, and and uh, that doesn't that doesn't happen by accident. You don't stay in business if you're not if you're not taking care of the students and you're not minding your business, but uh, my passion was less about business and more about training and, and teaching and getting after it. So now's my uh, time, I think, to trade on my gym readiness. <laughs> you know I mean? Cause I was the constant gym rat, you know, I, I was training and getting after it and working out and pushing and, that uh, uh, training volume is pretty much how I defined myself. And then I got out there and got after it and, and uh, would try to motivate others to follow along, you know, that, uh, and, and still do to this day. I mean, I just had a, uh, had a big women's camp. Uh, I host every, uh, that I've been, gosh, I, we were trying to figure it out. I guess it's 13, 14 years running now that I've had ladies come in from around and, and, uh, come in and train. I've, uh, come in and work out with me. I have, uh, various, you know, schools that are affiliated with me and, 
I know, uh, like this coming Sunday, we've got uh, guys coming in from around the state and uh, people getting ready that want to go. A couple people from out of state that are getting ready to go to the IBJJF World. So we'll come in and run a, uh, do a little bit of a training session to help people get ready. And so still trying to push people and, and train hard. But now, as far as the business goes, is my time to kind of trade on that knowledge that gained over a lifetime of of pushing it hard and you know like i said as uh as you get older you kind of i tell people there's an evolution you go from player to player coach to coach to, you know that's <laughs> to ad you become more like the athletic director there's there's a uh i guess a certain uh, uh progression through uh through that martial art uh career that uh that you follow and i can tell that i'm you know have still following it but in the meantime i'm still trying to maintain some uh, physicality and maintain some fitness and and uh in fact i even wrote a book on dealing with you know injury uh you know, along the way of earning eighth degree in this, eighth degree in that, seventh degree in this, seventh degree in that, fourth, you know, I mean, you, you push and you say it fast, but then, uh, you know, I had years where I competed every weekend and, you know, I fought a lot and, and competed internationally and, uh, and like any uh, professional athlete, you know, my body is uh, taking its fair share of, of, uh, of abuse. And so, I, uh, you know, you start saying the things, you know, I've blown, you know, I ruptured two discs in my lower back, blew out L4, L5. I've had four hip surgeries, including two resurfacings. I've had two knee surgeries. I've had, you know, shoulder surgery, attached a bicep. They had to go in and reattach a bicep and, you know, clean up my uh, rotator cuff. And so, uh, you know, like anything else, try to turn, uh, make lemonade <laughs> out of the lemon. And uh, I wrote a book that was published by Black Belt Magazine uh, called Stay in the Fight, a martial athlete's guide to preventing and overcoming injury. You know, with having had both hips resurfaced on a good day, I could still hit a full center split. Uh, you know, I'm still kicking. I can still blast the tie pads. You know, I'm still uh, I'm taking a group of guys to Brazil uh in june uh, you know going down there and doing a uh doing doing a training camp in maceo brazil which is a city up in the northeast going down to see my coach and taking some people down there to train so um with some injuries and surgeries that would have uh you know probably taken some people uh totally off the mat to been able to uh been able to uh, overcome and so the book was kind of like you know the formula that i that i followed um and, and being able to uh you know stay uh stay active because you know it's just part of the human condition you didn't get injured you know i mean just i, I noticed that anytime i've ever been in a doctor's office there were a whole bunch of people in the same waiting room as I was that were not athletes that were there for the same reason I was in there. So, so if you didn't do all that stuff, you might not have torn down your body. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe, but maybe not, you know, lots of people are in there for the same things. And, and, uh, you know, doing what you have to do. And if I'm going to be injured, it might as well be doing something that I truly, uh, truly enjoy. But then, uh, being able to overcome and get back on the mat, I think is, uh, is, is huge. And, and you have to have a holistic approach to being able to do that. I kind of shared that formula in, uh, the book that I wrote. Cool. And we'll, you know, we'll drop that link. We'll, we'll get a link for the book and we'll drop that in the show notes. And for anybody that might be new to the show, whistlekick martial arts radio.com. Well, and I noticed too, that, uh, it, kind of neat century martial arts is now selling the uh is selling the book i guess a cheap and a bash plug for century but they're uh they have the book it's available on amazon and uh it's also available uh through uh through century so, okay. so. yeah we'll make sure we, we link to that now, cool we've we've heard a bunch of stories a bunch of of wanderings and i mean that in a positive way 
as we talk about your journey through the martial arts from, from start to where you are now. And I love the stories. If I asked you what was your favorite story from your time training, what would that story be? Oh, heavens. You know, uh, oh, <laughs> It's a, it's a great question, but one that's not really easily answered that, uh, just, just because there's just been too, uh, too many, uh, too many over the years, you know, I mean, I've got, uh, like I said, I've been blessed of training with so many, I mean, you know, from, I guess, sparring Joe Lewis to, you know, training with Bill to, you know, going down to Brazil and training down there, the, uh, it's, uh, you know, I don't have one that just supersedes, uh, supersedes all others. And I guess that's, uh, I think that's a good thing. Um, because there, you know, I, I don't have, I don't have that one, I don't have that just that one just because I've been blessed with so many that I think they're they all kind of shine on the on the same uh, on the same level. You know, I, I uh, have laughed and cried and bled. <laughs> you know, it just it's amazing to me how the martial arts. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's life. I, I, you know, there's good times, there's bad times, there's being friends and really kind of, you know, there's a lot of unique characters in the martial arts. I think some of the best people I've ever met have been in the martial arts. Some of the craziest people I've ever met have been through the martial arts. And the uh, I've been blessed with some really, really, really good times and, and great training. But it's funny how when you ask that question, you know, I didn't have, I don't have just that one one particular story that, uh, you know, a moment that, that comes to mind. And I, I think it goes to just having done so much training over the years, you know, I mean, I can remember prior to going to Athens, Greece, you know, being down in Shreveport, Louisiana, sleeping on a, on a martial arts school floor as we're getting ready to, to go, or, you know, going, to uh, having, uh, having those priceless moments with uh, Joe when he came to town and we were training one-on-one and he would be sharing, sharing information or, you know, flying to Brazil and getting off the plane after being up for 24 hours and traveling and having my instructor know, great man, come on, we're going to the gym <laughs> and then taking me straight to the school and, proceeding to maul me after, you know, I'm, I'm like delirious and he's all excited to see me. So I just immediately start training and just have, uh, there's so many of those. It's like the kaleidoscope of, uh, images, but you know, none of them, you know, I think they're all, they're all up there just because I love them all. Nice. Now you keep coming back to some of these people in your life that you, that you love, that you respect, that have been so influential. But if there was one name that you would love to add to that list, someone you haven't trained with, who would you want to train with? Hmm. You know, I'm, uh, I would like to train with Dan Innocento. Um, I've been real fortunate to uh, have had an opportunity to train with uh, students of his. Um, and there's been. Uh, uh, I've been real fortunate to have had an opportunity to hit tons and tons of seminars by really, really good people. But I think, uh, uh, you know, Dan and Osano is one person that I'm hoping, uh, to, uh, get to work out with. I mean, that's kind of a, a thing that I intend to make, uh, make happen just, so that I can say I got to train with Dan Inosano. So he's he's one person that immediately uh, comes to mind that I haven't had the opportunity our paths have not crossed yet, and I uh, hope to uh, hope to rectify that here soon. Yeah, he's he is absolutely an incredible man. I've I've spoken with some people who have trained with him, 
at length and they just you know it, it he's just on a different level than than nearly everyone else that's ever done this yeah I, you know his legacy i've been able you know i mean uh what a what a wonderful legacy in the martial arts and to have uh accomplished what he's accomplished over the years and the cross training that he's done and and uh uh, I mean, I've been fortunate to have trained with lots of people that have trained with them. I just not yet had that, uh, not yet had that, uh, pleasure. So that's, he's definitely, uh, he's definitely on my list of people that I would like to, uh, that I would like to, uh, train with. That's for sure. We've heard a lot today about the good, the positive things, the things that, you know, keep you motivated. But if we were to flip it, if we were to talk about something on the other end of the spectrum, a low point in your life and how you were able to move through it because you're a martial artist, what would that story be? Oh, uh, you know, I, I think it's my uh, uh, dealing with, with some of the hip issues um, going through and having my, uh, having my uh, hips replaced that... Uh, uh, resurfaced. That's those were definitely uh, difficult, uh, difficult times because um, I a you just in a lot of pain. You know, I mean, uh, there's uh, especially when you love to train and you love to work out, and then all of a sudden you can't uh, do some of the things that you want to do, and then you can see the gains that you've made kind of get stripped away and, and, uh, dealing, uh, dealing with the, uh, with hip injury. Um, you know, it's just, it's painful. It's hard to explain. And, and I let my first hip go, uh, I had a surgeon, I had a vascular necrosis of the hip in my uh, left hip. And that's what caused that one to end up. And so I had, uh, a core decompression surgery where they went in and they hollowed out the femoral head and, uh, but where the necrotic lesion was on the top of the femoral head kind of acted like a cheese grater. I mean, it just grated away at the cartilage. And so I ended up bone on bone. And, uh, it, while the core decompression surgery probably bought me some time, it didn't stop me from having to have it, uh, redone, replaced. And, um, uh, I was actually part of a clinical trial for Wright Medical, and uh, I was part of the Wright Medical's uh, uh, clinical trial for their Conserve Plus metal-on-metal metal hip resurfacing procedure. And I flew out to uh, Salem, Oregon, and had uh, had that surgery done. And then uh, in my right hip, uh, I had femoroacetabular impingement. And, uh, I ended up like 12 years after my first hip, I had to have my second hip, you know, I had to have my, uh, other hip done. So, but the first one was, I think the scariest, um, the second one was tough just because I knew how bad it was going to suck. You know, you, uh, when you're going, oh, great. But I, I, I had a better you know, I had a better handle. I knew what was going to happen. Uh, I had a better idea of what was everything that was going on. It's kind of the, with the first one, it was the great unknown and, uh, you're not sure what you're going to be able to do and, um, what you're going to be able to, uh, you know, I just didn't know I was going to affect my, my career. And, uh, so that was tough, but I, I do feel like the martial arts helped me with that quite a bit, you know, and defining the challenge, uh, redefining the fight, you know, the fight now, this, the, the opponent was, was, uh, was the pain and the, 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 uh, the disease and being able to overcome it and understanding and learning and educating myself about my body. And, uh, that's how I, uh, you know, trained for the fight and got myself in as good a shape as I could be in, you know, going into surgery and then being able to, to uh, do what 
do what I needed to do to give my body the best chance to recover and rehab and, and, uh, continue, uh, continue on. And so that, uh, that was, but that was a tough time. You know, it's, it's tough when all of a sudden you're not able to do everything that you want to do and you don't know if you're going to be able to get back to it. And I was fortunate, fortunate in that, uh, I have, uh, been able to continue to punch and kick and grapple and, and, uh, I was able to, uh, you know, get past, get past that, not once, but twice, you know, and that, uh, that's where Bill, you know, again, my mentors, you know, Bill's, uh, was, has had his hips, uh, his hips done. And one of them he's had done twice and, uh, being able to, uh, you know, he was able to give me a lot of positive, uh, positive positive support and then watching him you know what he's able to uh, do i mean guys in his 70s he's still moving remarkably well you know his kicks uh are looking fantastic and and uh so it's a true testament to what you can uh to what you can overcome and come through so he was a big uh he was a big supporter uh in that and i you know, it, it isn't just like if you're really into your martial arts, then you're going to uh, draw draw strength, you know, from that. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves to draw strength from the things that we've been able to do. But it's helped me out in a lot of circumstances. Uh, besides just physical injury, you know, business decisions and um, interpersonal relationships. Um, there's, there's just a lot of ways that, uh, the martial arts can give you some quiet confidence, give you, uh, you know, confidence in yourself and, and a little bit of perseverance and, and uh, ability to, you know, face, face yourself, face your fears, face your challenges. And, uh, and, and, you know, grow as an individual and, and take, uh, take life's, uh, uh, life's obstacles and turn them into challenges and, and work hard to overcome those. And that's, uh, and it's a bitter pill, you know, it's funny cause I'm uh, writing the book. I wrote the book after my first hip was done, but before my second hip. And so then going back and actually, you know, I mean, it's always a, practicing what you preach and, you know, you kind of go through those, uh, stages of, of, you know, depression, denial and depression and then acceptance and then overcoming. And you, uh, it's easy to give out advice and it's sometimes a little more bitter when you have to follow your own advice, but uh, being able to recognize that you need to follow your own advice is really, uh, really important you know i mean uh, I've, I've found many times you need to stop because as martial art instructors we wear a lot of different hats and uh, a lot of times you're you're asked for your opinion and you're asked for your advice and um sometimes you just kind of have to stop and and uh go what would i tell somebody else to do in this situation you know and uh then I probably need to do what I would tell somebody else to do. And that, uh, and, and being able to identify and recognize that it's important. Um, being quick to go see, seek help from, uh, those that know way more about something than you do. That's, uh, I think that's another, uh, important, uh, important thing. So, you know, there are a lot of little life lessons that we learn as martial artists that, uh, we can apply to our everyday, uh, everyday affairs and uh, certainly tried to do that uh throughout my uh throughout my life for sure what are your goals what are you looking out looking forward to maybe it's around legacy maybe it's you know around particular people you've talked a lot today about others i mean we, we heard a lot about you but in almost everything you said you were talking about yourself as you related to other people, whether they be people you looked up to or people you were teaching. What do you consider? What do you think about when you look out over the next however many years 
of your time training? You know, one of my, uh, <laughs> to continue to train, my, uh, I've got two weightlifting buddies that we lift a couple of three times a week, two, three times a week. One's 25 and the other one's 80. So <laughs> Mr. Perry Sorry. at, uh, 80 years of age, uh, you know, I, I, uh, so greatly, uh, so greatly admire him. You know, I mean, I had him doing pull-ups wearing a 20 pound weight vest last, uh, Thursday. I mean, this isn't something that, you know, sometimes happen. This is, this happens like on a regular basis. And, uh, uh, we have a rock steady boxing program that I recently started here when got certified and, uh, we, uh, we do the rock steady boxing for Parkinson's and one of the programs that we run here in my gym and, uh, Mr. Perry's one of our assistants in the rock steady program. And it's a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. And, and, uh, he's also a training buddy, you know, <laughs> he comes in and, and lifts and works out, but just, uh, you know, so I look at, at people like Bill Wallace. I look at Mr. Perry, 80 years old. Mr. Perry's 80, and Bill's in his 70s, and these guys are still working out. Well, that's what I want to continue to do, you know, is to continue to uh, continue to train, continue to work out. And, uh, you know, uh, anybody that uh, ever follows me, you know, the thing on, on like, on Facebook, you know, and, and – I, uh, Danny during LDMA, I'm listed on Facebook, but I end a lot. It's kind of like Groundhog's Day because it's, you know, seminars, camps, clinics, workouts. And, but a lot of times I'm, I, I sign off with train on. And, uh, I think all the, <clears throat> constantly speak to the benefit of martial arts. Uh, you can, you can talk about it. You can read about it. You can watch it on YouTube. But if you want to experience the benefits for yourself, you got to get out there and do it. You know, you've got to be able to train on. And so, um, helping people, I mean, you know, physical fitness is a use it or lose it. It's uh, scary. You know, 72 hours after you last work out, you're revert, you're going, it's going away. Sometimes I think it's about 12 hours after my last workout for me personally, but you know, suffice to say, if you're not actively engaged in, uh, when it comes to your health, I mean, I, I, I do a lot of self-defense, uh, speeches. Uh, I'm the defensive tactics instructor for our sheriff's department. I'm a reserve deputy with, uh, the sheriff's department here. I mean, it's kind of my community, uh, community service. I, I'm engaged with our, our sheriff's department and, uh, I do a lot of speaking for the sheriff's department too on self-defense and there's, you know, a lot of martial art instructors get asked to go around and talk about uh, that aspect. Um, but I always tell everybody, anytime I do a self-defense and assault, uh, you know, uh, uh, crime prevention, assault awareness, assault avoidance kind of, uh, of speech, I tell everybody, if you're really interested in self-defense, if you're truly interested in self-defense, and most people in the martial arts are, I tell them, well, you got to work out. <laughs> you know I mean, you're a thousand times more likely to die from a health or stress-related disease than you are somebody jumping on top of you and attacking you. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, more scary to think about somebody assaulting you, but having somebody, uh, 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 but the truth is, is that you're less likely to be attacked than, than having some kind of health or, or stress related disease getting you. So maintaining a sense of health is, is really important. And I, now my legacy, getting back to your question is going to be in trying to be that guy that's not just talking about it, but being about it. I want to continue to be able to work out and continue to uh, teach and, you know, as, uh, as I as continue to hopefully grow older, that uh, you know, being able to uh, be a be a uh, a coach and a cheerleader for the martial arts, being able to encourage people to to train. Um, for me now, it's you know my young guys that are 
you know, new guy, guys that are just getting into uh, starting their martial art careers, young school owners. Um, you know, I, I find myself doing more consulting and helping uh, helping people with their schools and, and uh, helping to keep guys uh, motivated. And that uh, now my, my, my students become my legacy, you know, my, uh, the guys that I've got that are out there and they're the ones doing the competing. And, you know, I've got a, right now, uh, a student of one of my students is in the ultimate fighter house. A young man named uh, Bryce Mitchell is currently on the tough show that's being aired. That's on TV right now. I mean, he won his fight last Wednesday night on the tough show. So I think that's pretty cool that I've got, got a uh, student that's actually, uh, you know, produced a student that's fighting on TV. Uh, another lady that I've had opportunity to train um, is making her UFC debut, Andrea KGB Lee. Uh, Andrea Lee is going to be fighting in the UFC in Chile uh, this Saturday, which I think is uh, pretty neat. I've had opportunity to, uh, Andrea came to my women's camp a few years ago. I um, was there when she made her pro debut. I've, I've gone down to uh, Louisiana. She's out of Shreveport, and I've had an opportunity to work with her several times and uh, uh, help train her. And it's really uh, uh, her husband, Donnie Aaron, is a friend of mine. And it's really uh, neat to see her uh, get to make her uh, UFC debut and looking forward to seeing her fight this Saturday. Um, I've had guys, uh, you know, fight, fight all over. And so this, this, the schools that are, you know, and, and, and I tell my people all the time, I'm, I'm as happy personally. I, I get just as much enjoyment. Uh, I, I love working with my fighters, but I also like working with people that are just wanting to get going in martial arts that are, you know, excited about, about training that are just starting the, uh, about starting the journey. I think it's all about helping, uh, helping others. And so, uh, whether I'm doing that for a new student in my gym or whether I'm helping somebody with their journey and, and getting a school going or, uh, that's, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I think that's just awesome. So that, uh, building, building my team, building the organization and providing opportunity for others. That's, pretty much where I'm at right now in my career. Nice. Awesome. Clearly you're in, you're so passionate. I mean, just talking to you, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling itchy. I'm feeling like I want to, I want to go throw some kicks, you know, go some, go do some, some super foot drills. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it just, it, it's, there are people that we have on the show who seem to go through these phases with their relation to martial arts. And as you said, full circle with some of the things going on in your life with some of the things in martial arts. But the thing that, that you haven't said at any point is that you've lost your passion or your dedication to your training. And that's motivating. That's inspiring. And that brings us back to the very beginning that if you're not passionate about what you're teaching, if you're not passionate about how you're going to benefit from it. Nobody else is going to resonate with that. They're not going to be engaged enough to stick around and learn what you have to offer. True. Very true. And, and it's going to be, you know, it's simple, but it's not necessarily easy. You know, we're all going to have, we're all going to get challenged, man. I, I, uh, loving, uh, you know, I lovingly refer to, uh, uh, the secret vitamin that I have to take quite often at this stage of my life. Um, you know, I take a lot of vitamin S and I have people ask me, what the hell is vitamin S? And I tell them, suck it up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, uh, that, uh, it, it, uh, I've got lots of, but, you know, dots and uh, how do you do it? That's why I take vitamin S. And you look at me quizzically and I'm like, yeah, I'll suck it up. I'm going to start laughing. But, there's a lot of truth to that. And it's not always, you know, it's simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. You know I mean? I've, uh, uh, and I, I 
been challenged to recently. I had a heel spur, and uh, man, I had no idea just how painful. When you get a heel spur, you walk with a limp, and then you walk with a limp, and then your back kind of gets strapped up, and then your back strapped up, and you're walking with a limp, and then your knee hurts. And, you know, it's kind of, it's amazing how the body doesn't work in isolation. So, uh, and then it means, well, you know, spending extra time stretching and, uh, you know, doing your physical, you know, again, having to, to practice what you preach and that's meeting it head on and listening to the body. And there's a fine line between, you know, I don't think you train with injury. You have to learn how to train around them. Um, if I quit training every time I had an injury, I'd have never gotten anything done. So being able to, and, and redefining, sometimes my training is more focused than dealing with whatever, you know, ache, pain, or hurt that I'm suffering at the time, you know, getting in and, okay, uh, I can either whine about my back. And I, you know, I serve a lot of cheese and crackers because I like to serve cheese and crackers when I whine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my back hurts. <laughs> so, you know, but I don't want to just whine. I also want to do something about it. So I, I try to, you know, I was here in my gym at six o'clock this morning, you know, just stretching. We, you know, my, uh, I have an active recovery workout where it's, you know, just a gentle, I think it's kind of the yin and yang of life. Sometimes you have to train easily so you can train hard. And I, uh, I was walking around the gym, you know, we walk for 20 minutes, we come in, we get on the physio ball, we got on a foam roller, we stretch, we do uh, hip mobility drills. We, uh, you know, maybe some four count kicks, um, you know, some gentle calisthenics and, and, uh, it's, it's not my, my most hardcore workout of the day, but it's one that allows me to do things the rest of the day, you know, so that as the day goes on, you know, train with a little more, a little more intensity, but I'm a, I'm a big believer in that, uh, in that concept of active recovery where you're, you know, taking care of some, taking care of the body and, and which allows me to be able to, to go after it a little bit more hardcore later on, you know? So, and that's, that's a discipline in and of itself, you know, and get out of bed and you feel like you've just been hit across your kidneys with the two by four, you're walking with the limp or you got this hurt or that hurt. No, no, just talking about, I'm talking about anybody that's been involved for any length of time. And there's just, you know, show me guys never been injured in the martial arts. I'll show you somebody didn't train real hard. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I think, uh, well, Bill said, you know, it, it, it's still, you know, if you don't ain't limp, if you don't limp, you ain't, dead. you know what I mean? He's, there's, uh, uh, it's funny. There's uh, tons and tons of people that if they've done this at any length of time, but uh, I think that's also just kind of like in life, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's very few people that come out unscathed and nobody makes it out alive. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's just part of it, but, uh, For sure. yeah, cool. Fun. Well, if anybody listening wants to find you online, maybe they want to reach out. You've talked about how you offer seminars. You know, maybe somebody out there, hopefully more than a few somebodies, have been really engaged with what you're saying, and, and they want to know more about you, your book, all that. How would they find you online? Website, social media, what should we put in the show notes? Yeah, Living Defense, uh, livingdefense.com uh, is my uh, school website. Um, Living Defense Martial Arts on Facebook or Danny Dring. LDMA on uh, Facebook and you know from uh, it's funny I, I do I'm blessed that I do get to travel around the country and uh, teach seminars so I guess I'll be uh, uh, between the camps and clinics I take people uh, like some leading a group of guys to Brazil uh, to train the last week in June uh, was just up at Terry Dow's uh, martial arts symposium in Manchester I'll be in uh, St. Pete at uh, teaching at uh, Bill Wallace's camp uh, here the first weekend in June. Um, I'll be running a, uh, I've got a uh, Joe Lewis fighting systems camp that I'm doing uh, 
in July for kickboxing. We do that prior to the IKF, the International Kickboxing Federation's World Amateur Championships. Generally run a JLFS camp, uh, you know, let people get some kickboxing in. Um, from uh, self-defense, like law enforcement defensive tactics, to BJJ, to, you know, kickboxing, tie boxing, to, you know, you name it, I, all things martial. You know, sticks, knives, and 45s. I, I, I teach the civilian carry concealed law and blend firearms into my martial arts quite frequently. So uh, I uh, I try to, uh, you know, that's the, the benefit of being a gym rat is that at this stage of my career, I have a little, little bit to offer in a lot of different subjects. So um, uh, if anybody's interested, definitely they can reach out and catch me. Uh, on Facebook, uh, Danny Dring LDMA, message me or um, go to my website. There's contact forms there, livingdefense.com. Yeah, both of those uh, pretty good ways to catch hold of me. Right on. And we always ask our guests for one final thing as we send it out. What parting words would you give to the folks listening? You know, uh, <laughs> Pretty simple. I think I've already stated it, but I, I think it's worth staying again. Just train. You know, that uh, engagement uh, in, in the martial arts and, and everybody, it's, I truly believe in the benefits of, of working out. And, you know, I've got uh, from Mr. Perry that's 80 years old to, uh, kids that are three years old. I've got a guy that's a cardiologist. It's got his whole family in here, uh, working out. I mean, the benefits of the martial arts and, and they all come from coming to class. You know, I, I tell everybody their job is to show up. My job is to, uh, teach them. I can do a lot of things for them, you know, and the martial arts can do a lot of things for everybody out there, but it, it all is dependent on you showing up. So, uh, you know, don't just uh, don't just talk about it. Be about it. You know, get out there and and uh, you know, we're not all going to be world champions. We're not all going to, you know, we're all not going to be world beaters and and everything else. But everybody can uh, can enjoy the benefits that you know going to class can uh, offer. You know, raising that heart rate up, getting your uh, getting your heart rate elevated, getting some deep breaths and, and, uh, stretching those muscles and, and working out a little bit. Uh, I just encourage everybody to, uh, you know, go to class, just, just show up. That's, uh, such a, such a part of the martial arts. And again, it's simple, but it ain't easy. You know, I mean, there's so many things in life that can compete for your, uh, for your time. And, and, uh, you really have to be focused to be able to 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 make it in. But I encourage everybody, be consistent, get out there and work out. We've spoken a lot over the last few months about the mentality of remaining a student. And here with Master Dring, I think we see that exemplified. What happens when you maintain that student, that white belt attitude? your entire training career, your entire life. You see some pretty amazing accomplishments. You see people grow into wonderful human beings who can share what they've learned with others. And honestly, I think that's why I clicked with him so quickly the first time we met. Thank you, Master Dring, for coming on the show. If you want to check out the show notes with links, photos, all kinds of stuff that we talked about today, you can find those over at WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com. You can check out the products at WhistleKick.com. You can jump on the newsletter list at either site. You can get to us on social media. We are at WhistleKick on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and a bunch of other places. You can find these episodes on YouTube. We're just, we're all over the place. And if you want to email me directly, that's jeremy at whistlekick.com. I want to thank you for listening today. Thanks for everyone who is supporting Whistlekick in various ways, whether that's sharing these episodes or making a purchase. I appreciate it. We all appreciate it because without you, 
we wouldn't be here. That's all I have for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.